Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. Um, we're in six five three. We're gonna learn to. We're getting down to the nitty gritty. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of this thing. So we know what the integral from a to b of f of x dx represent f of x dx as opposed to equals f of x dx. Remember, this dx is just think of the integral from a to b and dx as framing in the integrand. Okay, and what this represents is the area, now we're going to get a little more refined in our definition, between, I'm going to change that a little bit, um, f of x and the x-axis. Okay, by the way, I changed the stylus or the little nib, I think is what it's called, in my pen, so I'm a smooth mover right now. Um, what we're going to do is, what happens if I want to take the integral, remember how last section we proved the integral from 0 to 1? of x squared dx. We proved that this was one-third. Now I'm going to show you how to actually do this and I'm not going to prove it for now. Okay, I'm going to prove it in the next section when we do the fundamental theorem of calculus. But before we do, I'm going to give you, let's call it, let's call it a theorem. I'm going to give you a theorem and that is this. If I take the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Remember the god-awful process of trying to solve this integral by virtue of the fact that we knew that this was the limit as n went to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x sub i delta x. Remember that? But guess what our theorem is going to give us? It's going to give us a wonderfully simple way to do this. I simply take the antiderivative of f of x and I evaluate it from a to b. Now notice this notation. My integral on the left, the integral from a to b, and my dx change. All right? My dx disappears, and I end up with this vertical line that says, hey, I just took an antiderivative, and then I'm going to plug in f of b minus f of a. Now we're going to prove this with the fundamental theorem of, calcula of calculus down the road, but look at the beauty of it. It's so gorgeous. And we already had this intuition about the relationship between the area. Remember the problem that I did right at the beginning of the chapter where I said that this is V of T and we went from A to B and we got the distance, which was represented by the area, was just B minus A times this constant V of T, right? Remember that? So there's a relationship between this antiderivative relationship between velocity and displacement, or in this case distance, because the velocity is always positive. And this actually proves it for us. Now, I'm not going to prove this one specifically because everything gets proven with the, with, the fundamental, uh, with the fundamental theorem of calculus. But let me show you how this works. If I take the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx, this says take the antiderivative of the integrand. Remember, all of this, this integral from 0 to 1 and this dx, they're just notation. They almost, they're, excuse me, they're just notational. They act almost like parentheses around the integral. But now I have this thing that says, okay, to be able to evaluate this, take the antiderivative. Well, the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed thirds. And then I evaluate from 0 to 1. And then this tells me to basically plug in 1, so I'm going to get 1 cubed thirds minus 0 cubed thirds. And guess what I get? One third. Ta -da. Now watch this. What if I take, say, the integral from uh, from zero to five of let's go um, three x cubed plus sine x minus four to the x dx. And notice it's a definite integral. We'll talk a little bit about what to do with indefinite integrals down the road. But once we have this relationship between the integral and the antiderivative, everything gets pretty easy. So let's, let's play, shall we? According to this, it says take the antiderivative. The antiderivative of 3x to the 4, or excuse me, 3x cubed is 3 fourths x to the 4th minus cosine x, because the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, so hopefully you see that. And then what was the antiderivative of, of a to the x? You remember that one? It was 4 to the x divided by the natural log of 4, right? Now I'm going to evaluate from 0 to 5, right? That's all that I'm doing. So this becomes 3 fourths times 5 to the 4th 
minus the cosine of 5. I'm not afraid of that. Remember, that's just a radian measure. It's a real number. Minus 4 to the fifth. <clears throat> excuse me, divided by the natural log of 4. I'm going to slap that in parentheses, then I'm going to go minus, this is 3 fourths times 0 to the fourth. Ooh, this new pen is working fabulously. Minus the cosine of 0, minus 4 to the 0 over ln of 4. You guys, the calculus is over. I keep saying this. Calculus is a blink. The calculus was, take the antiderivative. This just becomes an algebraic slash numeric thing to do. I mean, if I had to, oh, God, I don't even know that I want to do this, but it's 3 fourths times 625, right? That's 25 squared, right? Minus cosine to the fifth, whatever, or cosine to the fifth, cosine of 5, minus, what's that, 2 to the tenth? So 1,024 ln of fourths, whatever that is, minus, well, that's cool, that's 0, minus 1, minus... 1 over the natural log of 4, and then we just can clean this up numerically. And then my answer is going to be some rounded value, right? It's going to be approximately some rounded value because this is not going to spit out a rational number, and this certainly isn't going to spit out a rational number. Isn't that cool? Now watch what I did here. I used my rules about integrals of sine, sums, and differences, and then I just used strict, straight-up antiderivatives. Now in your book, I'm going to write this right now, I'm going to write it in red, on page, on page, 360.9. Memorize. I want you to memorize those antiderivatives. So pull out your book, antiderivatives. I want you to pull out your book, and those are going to be the ones that I expect you to memorize. You Like vocab, I very rarely ask you to memorize things. So this is going to be one of those things where if you don't memorize, I'm going to scream and yell. The other ones that you're going to want to memorize the antiderivatives are, you, they'll come, all right? You, once you start seeing them over and over and over again, you'll, you'll, they'll come to you, okay? Now, how about something called an indefinite, definite integral, integral. In other words, what if it has no limits? If I throw the integral of f of x dx at you, well, now think about that. Let's say that I have some function that looks like that. All right, this is f of x. I don't have any limits. I don't have any place to block it off and find a definite area. However, I can still use this to come up with a value, all right, to come up with a formula down the road once I'm given values, okay? But I want to come up with a formula that I can use down the road, all right? I, I said that a little strangely. And it's real simple. Very much like derivatives give, derivatives of functions give functions, indefinite integrals of functions gives functions as well, right? We know that. We know that the antiderivative of x to the fifth spits out x to the sixth, six plus c. And that's the way that we deal with indefinite integrals. So in general, if I have a function that I'm taking an integral of, an indefinite integral, there are no limits, notice. It's simply the antiderivative of that function plus c. So if I'm taking the integral of, say, 1 over x uh, minus 5x to the sixth um, plus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx, well, 1 over x is one of those that you absolutely have to memorize. It's the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 5 sevenths x to the seventh. And then this guy, ooh, I've never seen it. Well, luckily, it's on that page that you have to memorize. All right, this ends up being um, plus the inverse sign. Inverse sign of x, and then plus c. Now, what I've done is I have spit out a formula, much like when I took a derivative. It was a formula for the slopes of all lines tangent to the function. This is a formula that I can use for all values of the integral, of definite integrals from a to b. I need only be given an a and a b, and all of a sudden, this guy works swimmingly. It works just like this. Now, I want to show you guys something. Let's play with a real simple integral. I want to take the integral, excuse me, I want to take the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of x dx. Let's do that guy, okay? So here we go. Look, we're off to the races. Now I'm already visualizing sine of x, right? I got this in my head. So this is y equals sine of x. Now think about this. 
I'm going to have an area here, which is most decidedly positive, and I'm going to have an area here, and I'll put, even put this thing in parentheses. Here's the problem is, let me change my, let me change my color. When I go to build a rectangle here uh, with the subinterval width of delta x, the quote unquote height of this is going to be f of x, which is less than zero which means the area of this rectangle, this a sub 2, is also going to be less than 0, isn't it? Now, delta x is going to be positive because I'm integrating from 0 to 2 pi. 0 is the smallest, 2 pi is the biggest. But the area, quote unquote, I realize in a geometric context, you're not allowed to have negative areas. But these areas of these rectangles are built using functional values, and the functional values can be negative. Well, let's see how it plays out. So. Are you ready? The antiderivative of sine is this equals a uh, negative cosine of x evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. Notice I make my integral sine go away and my dx go away as soon as I take an antiderivative. So this equals negative cosine of 2 pi minus negative, I got to respect thy negative, right? Cosine of 0. Well, let's see. Cosine of 2 pi. Well, now I got to visualize cosine. Right? Cosine of two pi. Oh, it's one. So I got negative one minus negative. Wait, cosine is zero. Ooh, look at that. It's bomb proof. Okay. So we got to be real careful here. However, what happens if I if I write the integral from zero to two pi from of sine x dx? I know that that's zero. But what if I write the the question as find the area between um, sine x and the x-axis on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Now it's a different ball game. Now they actually want the area, well I actually want the area. So having an area of 0 doesn't make sense. So how do I do that? Well remember the trick? What I do is I figure out when the function goes negative. And then rather than adding in a negative value, I subtract that out to make it positive, right? Now notice I'm asking about area versus integral. So now we're far enough along for you to realize there is a difference between, there's a technical difference between area and integral. If the function lives entirely above the x-axis like I have over here, there's no difference between area and integral. The area between f of x and the x-axis from a to b is exactly the same as the integral from a to b of f of x dx. But in this case, if I want that area, what I have to do is I have to take the integral from 0 to pi of sine x, right, dx, and I have to subtract out the integral from pi to 2 pi of sine x dx. Now there's also another way to do this. Remember, it's this negativity that's screwing us up. Is there a way for me to flip that function above the x-axis? So in other words, can I take my sign and it, rather than having it go under the x-axis, can I have it go, just kidding, since I'm looking for area, can I flip it above? Yeah, it's easy. C integral from 0 to 2 pi of the absolute value. Remember, absolute values take functions, negative parts of functions, and it flips them across the x-axis. The problem is, this is really hard to play with. To play with. It's not easy. There's not a formula that I can use. I actually have to go through and meddle with it. All right, well, let's actually do this, this problem. I'm not going to do this guy. I'm going to do this guy. All right, again, negative cosine of x from 0 to pi minus, now I'm going to go, I'm going to put this in some weird parentheses, so watch how this works. Negative cosine of x from pi to 2 pi. All right, now remember up here, if I just took the integral from 0 to 2 pi, I ended up in trouble. But we know that this right here is going to be negative cosine of pi, right, minus negative, respect thy negative, cosine, whoa, cosine, I got a little crazy there, sorry guys and gals. 